that is so true. And he has, and God has given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Christ to the glory of God the Father. Woo! My goodness, man. That's a great passage, and that's all of a tremendous word from the Lord. Goodness. So you guys have your, all your notes with you? You have, <laughs> you, have all of the, you have all of the 11 and all of that kind of stuff? Yeah, let me put this down right here. These are just a few of the rules of the Pharisees. I thought some of you might be interested in... Uh, I'm going to read a couple of those. These are just, this is just some little information about, the, about some of the rules of the Sabbath day. Not all the rest of them, just the Sabbath day. They're like, I think if I'm not mistaken, at one time I heard that uh, the Pharisees had created 719, um, 719 uh, commandments concerning the Ten Commandments. I mean, uh, uh, in, enhancements, in vision, uh, revisions, uh, additions to the Ten Commandments. Uh, just shows you a little bit about the nature of, of 719, but I, I may be just pulling that out of thin air. Uh, but I, 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 kinda, I do kind of remember that. You know, do you guys ever have that kind of thing where you, you think you remember something? It just seems so clear to you. It's just unbelievable. Like what kind of spices are up in, this, you know, in, the, in the cabinet, right? Some of that kind of stuff. I would have sworn yesterday, that I'm, I'm kind of getting off into something personal, but I... Uh, <laughs> Oh, yesterday, Tanya and I were talking about some kind of steak seasoning of some kind or another, and I would have sworn I, I would have lost all the money I had because I know I saw it right there with my own eyes. And man, I went over there and I looked at everything we had. We didn't have it. I, 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 I'm thinking, what? Where did I see that? And yeah, I guess so. I <laughs> guess. I guess I looked at it on a shelf somewhere, and then, you know, it just transposed itself right into our little spice rack up there. But anyway, <laughs> it does, man. It, you know, I, I don't know if that's kind of some of that getting older stuff or if that's just normal life and that kind of thing, you know. But normal, yeah, it'll be normal. We're talking about, uh, you know, we've been talking about the, the kingdom of God, and I, I know we've talked about it for a couple of weeks, and I shared a message a couple of weeks ago of just strictly about the kingdom of God. And the fact that everything Jesus said was about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. And, um, and, and often we just kind of overlook that as being, um, I don't know, maybe just a word you know, that somebody uses. Like uh, we use it when we say the Lord's Prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And, um, and we just kind of pass it by as if it's really just another way of saying the same thing. But it's not, and I, I hope that uh, maybe over the last few weeks you've seen a little bit of, of that. Uh, certainly today with the rest of this chapter, you'll get a good, really good, good chance to see what religion is all about and see what the, the opposite of the kingdom of God is. If you want, the kingdom of God is the rule and the reign and the government of God as described by God himself. Not that we make up some rules and that we, you know, have some customs and traditions and so forth. Uh, the kingdom of God is, is, is a kingdom that he rules over and he himself rules over. And we're part of that kingdom because we've been born into the family of God. However, you are aware that we do have an enemy that tries to, uh, uh, tries to defeat everything that God has and everything that God would want for us. God has a wonderful life. God has a marvelous plan. God has a great future. God has uh, assignments for us. And the enemy obviously would love to thwart those assignments and, and, and stop the forward progress of our life. And, and he does this by creating counterfeits of the real thing. Because if you have a counterfeit and you think it's real, then you're not going to be going after the real because you think you already have what is real. And so in, in the area of spirit life and faith life, uh, the, the antithesis of the real is religion. It's the rules, the restrictions, the requirements, the, um, the celebrations, the customs, the style of religion. And obviously, uh, many of you have been in churches in your life before that if you know, we just sat down and talked about it, you could probably describe much of what happens at church as just religion. 
Lots of talking about things, not much doing, you know. A lot of ceremony, a lot of pomp and circumstance, a lot of decoration, a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, ceremonial things that happen at altars and at Lord's suppers and uh, just, just all kinds of things like that. But, uh, but very little power of God. Very, very little evidence that, that the Spirit of God is even within a thousand miles of there. Well, the, the most likely place to see this and the best place to see this in the Scripture is by looking at the characters of the New Testament that are talked about more than anybody else except for God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and the disciples. The characters that are seen more often in the New Testament and talked about in so many ways, obviously, are the Pharisees. And the Pharisees is that super religious synagogue bunch that just hounded Jesus at every step, hounded the disciples at every step. As a matter of fact, it was the, the, it, it was, it was the Pharisees that, that did so much damage and, and brought Jesus to trial and brought the charges against Jesus and the Sanhedrin, which was the leading court of the Pharisees. Of course, one Pharisee broke free and became one of the greatest uh, leaders that the, that the kingdom of God has ever had, and that's the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul was a Pharisee at one time and actually, uh, w w actually stood there while Stephen was being stoned to death by the Pharisees and the people because so much had been stirred up against him. Uh, Paul actually stood there and held the coats of the people throwing rocks at, at Stephen, stoning him to death. Paul's own testimony was that he went down the road breathing out threatenings. Kind of like, I mean, I picture like a fire-breathing dragon, you know. I mean, Paul's own description is, man, I was, walk, I was going down the road like a fire-breathing dragon. I had papers in my, in my coat that gave me permission that if I found any Christian anywhere, that I had, I, had, I had permission, I had legal authority to take their life and kill them and destroy every church. And, of course, he was going in a little <laughs> wide spot in the road on his little donkey. And... Um, a place called Tekoa, and uh, a brilliant light hit him and knocked him off the back of that donkey and blinded him. And he's looking up and he's saying, who are you, Lord? And he said, I'm Jesus who you persecute. And I'm sick of this man. <laughs> and uh, he said, and, and, and Paul evidently said something to him that made him convinced that I'm willing to change, <laughs> you know, no, you know I'm, I, I see that, I, uh, that I'm out of my league here. Uh, and he said, well, you go down the straight street, and, you know, and he was instructed and so forth, and, 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 and the apostle Paul became uh, the leader of the kingdom of God, so to speak, really wrote about uh, two-thirds of the New Testament, the books, the letters, Corinthians, Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, uh, Thessalonians, Timothy, uh, just about a third of the whole New Testament, and became a great man. But the Pharisees generally didn't convert. They generally stayed in this religious spirit all the time. And of course, religion is the one thing that will uh, hinder us from being everything God calls us to be. And it's easy to counterfeit the things of God because it sounds so good. It sounds like this is a good thing. And, you know, the rules are the rules, and we need to make sure we obey the rules. And, you know, there are many of the giftings that we have as the children of God that really play into a religious spirit. Um, the administrators and the prophets and the teachers, they really kind of fall right into those rules kind of thing and that organization and administration kind of thing. But they are counterfeit, obviously, of the real thing. So let's get, let, me, let me just get on the chapter because i got a bunch of stuff to fill in, right? All right, here we go. Starting last week, and I'm just going to give you the ones from last week and just poof, go right on by. All right. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. Just a note now, just a note. Notice that the man could not see Jesus, but Jesus did see him. Which, look at your neighbor and say, I'm glad he can see me. Yeah, yeah, right. Whether you can see him or not, he can see you. So here's a blind man. Blind man can't see Jesus. He's not calling out for Jesus. He's not asking Jesus anything. He doesn't even know it's Jesus. He's blind. But Jesus sees him. And, and then we get introduced to this um, uh, condemning spirit, this critical spirit, this spirit of condemnation. 
from the disciples, no less. And the disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, or, or Jesus, Lord, Master, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Well, it appears to me that everybody in this miracle is blind except Jesus, right? And the disciples are blind. The guy's blind. The Pharisees are certainly blind. The guy's parents are blind. The citizens of the, of the town are blind. Everybody's blind except Jesus. And now the disciples are falling into this uh, spirit of condemnation, kind of religious thought about, okay, this guy's blind. He was blind from birth. Uh, uh, who sinned, him or his parents, said he was born blind? And so the first, uh, the first thing we saw about being a Pharisee is that you might be a Pharisee if you'd rather talk about a problem than do something about it. Lots of talk going, I mean, the, in, in Corinthians, uh, the Apostle Paul says that the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. So the kingdom of not God is not a bunch of talk. Now, you would never know this by going to church today, because at church, there's a lot of talking that goes on and not much, much action. But uh, this religious spirit is, can be detected by a uh, lot of talk, not much action. I know you've got that, so I'll just pass right on by. Jesus had a way of cutting short these religious arguments. And he sa answered and said, well, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Jesus basically says, you're wrong on both counts. The guy didn't sin, his parents didn't sin. But this guy's here so that I can do what I'm about to do so that the world can see that I am who I say I am. And uh, this is going to make a big splash. In other words, Jesus said, I'm about to do something here that is going to reveal the wonderful works of God. And this guy's sitting right here, set at the right point with the right issue at the right time, which shows you just how tremendously administrative God really is. I mean, imagine how much administration it took to get this guy at, that's born blind at the right place at the right time with the right people around him and all of this kind of stuff organized. Man, don't tell me God is not powerful. Look at your neighbor and say, there are lots of things God can do. Yeah, there are lots of things God can do. So Jesus cuts it short and says, okay, neither one of them. And then now Jesus makes this tremendous statement with which there is no disagreement among the people there or among our lives, I'm sure. He says, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. So this is Jesus saying, let me just straighten out the blindness of everybody. The blindness of everybody is going to be is going to be removed because I'm going to work the work of him that sent me while it's daytime. And then he makes this marvelous statement about light. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. Now, you know, maybe I'm making too much out of this, but when I see the light of the world, I'm thinking, all right, Jesus is about to give the guy sight. So what is it you need that, to, to be able to have sight? Well, you need the apparatus for seeing, right? Now, in physical sight, the apparatus for seeing would be my eyes, like, you know, my cornea, my retina, my optic nerve, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that, those are the apparatuses that I need in order to be able to have sight. And then secondly, I need those apparatus to be in proper working order. And then third, in order to have sight, I got to have light. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. I'm going to lie to everybody. I'm going to give us all sight. And of course, this is speaking physically here. I'm the light of the world. But it, it, our blindness, our darkness, Jesus is the light that gives us light that we might see ourselves as we really are and see him as he really is. Amen to that? Yeah. All right. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground. Now, everything was good up until that point. He said these things, he spat on the ground, and he made clay out of the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. All right, now, this, would, would you say, and, and I know we talked about it, and I showed you some passages where Jesus spit on a lot of people. And Jesus did spit on a lot of people. <laughs> and, uh, and, he, and he did miracles where he spit. And uh, so uh, this wasn't the first time that he had used spit, and, and it's not going to be the last time either, by the way. But... He had never done it this way before. He had never spit on the ground, and he had never got down and doodled in the spit on the ground and ro rolled up little clay balls made out of saliva and mud and then took them and put them on the guy's eyes. I mean, this was a brand new way of healing blindness is what I'm saying. 
So I, I want you to remember, just reflect in the back of your mind, and I'm just calling some of these things out because I know you listen to everything I say and remember everything. So just, I mean, this would be something that you'll go, oh yeah, I remember that. You remember when we were talking about the kingdom of God and we went to Matthew 13 and there were 10 different parables there. You remember all those different parables? The kingdom of heaven is like a pearl of great price. The kingdom of heaven is like a, you know, like this. And, and, and he goes down and the very last one he mentions, he looks at his disciples and he says, all right, all of these parables that I have been showing you about the kingdom, do you understand what I'm talking about? And they said what? Yes, Lord, we understand. And he said, all right, well, good. Because I'm going to tell you something else. I'm going to tell you that every scribe who is instructed in the kingdom of heaven is like a man who is a householder who brings forth out of his treasury good things old and new. You remember that? And I, you remember what I taught you about what that meant? What that meant is Jesus said, all right, now that you've been instructed in the kingdom of heaven and you understand what it is because you just said, yes, I understand. What your job is from now on is you're like a good householder, a, a good master of the house. You are an authority of the house, and you've been instructed, like scribes are instructed, and you've been instructed on the kingdom. And so what your job is, is your job is to take the new things about the kingdom of God and the old things that are traditions and things that have been settled for years and shared and they're wonderful and they're great and the people know about them and take those new things and old things and blend them together so that people can grab onto the kingdom of God. That's your job. That's the parable of the householder. So here, we've got something brand new in verse 6. Brand new way of doing things. Nobody's ever seen a blind man healed by spitting on the ground and making mud balls and putting them in his eyes. So now the disciples have seen a new thing, and then notice what Jesus says next. And he said to him, after he put the mud balls in his eyes, and he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. The pool of Siloam was a traditional spot for cleansing. It was a traditional spot where Jewish people went to cleanse things and to anoint things and so forth. And so Jesus took the pool of Siloam and the brand new way of mud and spit in the eyes by saying, we got some old stuff that, that you got that you grab onto and you know all about. And then we got some new stuff. And I need you to understand this new stuff in light of this old stuff so that you'll receive the new stuff because the new stuff is the way we're going to be doing things around here. And so Jesus now has confronted the whole issue. He's got a guy that he's put mud on. He's offended everybody there that is religious. Everybody that could be offended, he has offended them because Jesus has a way of offending things in order to call attention to the fact that things are changing. And if you can be offended many times, he is going to offend you because uh, you need to change your attitude. You need to change the way you look at things. You need to change the way life goes about you. And Jesus said, look, if you can be offended in me, then you need to change something about your life. And so we got a whole brand new way of living that Jesus is, put, is putting out to us on the earth. And we've got a whole a world full of religion that needs to see things in a new way. And so here we are, verse 7, he's, the guy goes and, he, and, he's, and he's washed and he comes back seeing. Now, I just want to remind you, this is for future verses that we'll look at in just a second. Uh, this guy doesn't see Jesus. The, the, the blind man doesn't see Jesus. He doesn't know who Jesus is. Like I told you in the first verse, the guy didn't see Jesus, but Jesus saw him. And so Jesus comes over and he just doodles and spits and, and then he puts mud on the guy's eyes. The guy's still blind, still can't see Jesus. Nobody has said Jesus. Nobody's identified Jesus. Nobody's talked about who it is that's doing this kind of strange stuff to you. Some of his friends probably looked at him and when he said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, and he was a little hesitant about it, some of his friends probably looked at him and said, do you know what he just did to you? <laughs> if you knew what he just did, you'd be in a lot more hurry than you are. And, you know, and, uh, and, 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 but, but he had never seen him. And, when he, and by the time he gets back, Jesus is gone. So... He doesn't know who did it. He doesn't know anything about the guy or what anything. All he knows is uh, he told me to go wash in the pool of Siloam, and I went and did it, and now I can see. Okay, all right, that's all, that's all I need to know. All right, so you might be a Pharisee if you're offended by the way God goes about doing his business, about the way God does what he does. Well, 
All right, the healed man comes back home now to his, to his people, and a religious discussion starts about what has, uh, what is, what has happened. The community starts discussing uh, what just happened. Verse 8, Therefore the neighbors and those who previously had seen that he was blind said, Is not this he who sat and begged? So now we've got a discussion going on in the community, and they're going to bring in the authorities. They're going to say, all right, we need to have somebody come in and take a look at this and try to help us understand, because isn't this that guy that was born blind? And so, so, so they call, they're going to call all the religious leaders together and, 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 and get their opinion of, of what's going on. Instead of, inst- instead of uh, celebrating with the guy, yeah, yeah. instead of rejoicing with the guy, Instead of entering into his joy about the fact that he used to be blind and now he can see, uh, they got to have a meeting. You know, we got to we got to discuss this. And and in verse nine, some said this is he, uh, and others said, well, well, he's like him. Uh, And and then the young man who's who's been healed hears what's going on. Uh, Here's these people arguing about about is it him? Is it not him? I mean, he looks like him. It might be him. I, you know, I think he had on that same shirt. And, and and the guy now, the guy that's been healed, gives the first of eight testimonies. Eight times in this passage, in this chapter, he's going to testify of what Jesus did for him. And so he says, I, "I'm I'm he." I mean, look, guys, I'm. I, I, I'm the man. I'm the man. I'm the one that did it. I know what happened. And then look at what happens next. How then were your eyes open? They demanded. Now I, I just want to. Maybe I'm making a little bit too out, too much out of this, but 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 the the fact that they they can't enter into his joy. They can't they can't get excited with him about what happened. But 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 now they demand an explanation. I mean, look, how did he do this? They demanded. I mean, what's wrong with these folks? Here's a guy standing there, and he's just been healed, and he's just been, his life's been changed. He's been blind all of his life, and they can't say one word of excitement about it. They just want to know, how did this happen to you? You run into people like this, don't you? Yeah, people, people that say, well, well, let me just ask you one thing. Let me just ask you one thing, which means, by interpretation, I'm not going to listen to a word you say, but when you get through speaking, I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. That's what I'm going to tell because I don't confuse me with the facts. My mind is already made up. And so they demand of the blind man an explanation, which basically is you might be a Pharisee if in the face of a certified miracle, you demand an explanation. All right. So the Pharisees aren't really looking for an answer. They're not really wanting an answer. They think they already know. Now, are you aware that we have gone now 12 verses in this chapter and we have not met the Pharisees yet? Mm-hmm. However, their, their uh, attitude and their nature has permeated everything that we've looked at so far. But we've not, actually made, we, we, we've not actually met them yet. So between verses 12 and verse 13, if you have a study Bible, and I know most <laughs> many people don't even carry Bibles anymore, you look at it online or whatever. But if you're looking at a study Bible, whether it's online or in a, in a physical Bible you have in your lap, it has, usually in study Bibles, it has paragraph headings, right? It like divides and it says certain things and it groups them. You know, it tells you, gives you a little clue and it's the heading of a paragraph. Well, between verses 12 and 13, let me see, hang, hang on a second, let me go. Verse 11, and he answered, okay, let me just stop. Let me, let me go on because I'm going I'm to give you that in just a second with 12 and 13. I, I got ahead of myself. He answered and said, a man, now this is, his, this is his second defense. This is his second testimony. He answered and he said, all right, a man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes. And he said to me, go to the pool, slum and, slum and wash. So I went and washed and I received my sight. Then they said to him, where is he? Which I want to say, what difference does it make? I mean, really. Why, 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 why do you want to ask him some other question? He said, and the guy says, um, uh, I don't know. Because he didn't know. I mean, he couldn't see when Jesus did it to him. 
And then Jesus said, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which was way down there. And by the time he got back and could see, Jesus was already gone. And so they say, where is he? And I don't know, which is because he didn't know where Jesus was. Let me, let me give you one little uh, word of liberty that, uh, that has helped me. And, and I want to just pass this, this thing on to you. Um, it is okay to say that you don't know, <laughs> especially if you don't know. <laughs> you know, there have been denominations started when somebody should have said, I don't know, and they answered the question, right? <laughs> right? So this guy says, I, 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 don't, I don't know. And, and, and so between verse 13, 12 and 13, here it is. There, I put the title up there, The Pharisees Investigate the Healing. Oh, joy, now we're going to find out the truth, right? The Pharisees are here to straighten all this stuff out for us. We're going to find out what really happened to this guy because now the Pharisees are on the scene. Uh, they brought him who formerly was blind to the Pharisees. Now it was the Sabbath when Jesus made the clay and opened his eyes. That is, oh my goodness. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, Jesus, you should have known better than this. Uh, I mean, what did, did you forget what day it was? What day it was? <laughs> the Sabbath day? Because as I mentioned to you, kind of as I was idling around at the start, uh, the Pharisees had all kinds of rules about the commandments, the Ten Commandments. They had created hundreds of rules in, in, in excess to the one, remember, the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, I, I, I laid this down, and I'm going to just read this. Uh, I'll try not to be boring. I'm just going to read it to you, all right? Uh, just because I want you to see what, what we're talking about when, when we talk about rules and what the Pharisees did to the Sabbath day, and they did this to everything, not just the Sabbath day, but every commandment of God. Remember, uh, you, you shall not uh, uh, worship other gods, uh, honor your father and your mother, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, commit adultery. I mean, th this is the kind of stuff they did to it. Now, let me just read this to you. Concerning the Sabbath observant in the Mishnah, which the Mishnah are just, is just simply the written version of Jewish oral traditions, uh, it lists 39 primary categories of labor that were not allowed on the Sabbath day. 39 categories of labor that were not allowed on the Sabbath day. The first 11 of these were steps leading to the production and preparation of bread, sowing, planting, reaping, binding sheaves, threshing, winnowing, selecting, grinding, sifting, kneading, and baking. Some examples, plowing, and there you're plowing. Included in this prohibition is any preparation or improvement of the land for agricultural use. This includes dragging chair legs in the soft soil, thereby unintentionally making furrows, pouring a glass of water on the ground, which would be enhancing the land for the growth of crops, making a hole in the soil would also provide protection for a seed placed there from rain and runoff. Even if no seed was ever planted there, the soil is now enhanced for the process of planting. In the area of reaping, Removing all or part of a plant from its source of growth is reaping. It is forbidden to climb a tree for fear that this may lead to one tearing off a branch. It is also forbidden to ride an animal as one might unthinkingly detach a stick to hit the animal with. Winnowing. Winnowing means sorting undesirable from desirable via the force of air, like separating the wheat from the chaff, letting the wind blow away the chaff. That is called winnowing. But listen to this. If one has a handful of peanuts in their paper-thin brown skins, you know, you've taken them out of the shell and now they got just the little skins around them. And, yeah, like little Spanish reds. And one blows on the mixture of peanuts and skins, dispersing the unwanted skins from the peanuts. This would be an act of winnowing. The next 12 categories apply similar steps to the preparation of clothing from the shearing of a sheep to the actual sewing of garments. 
These are followed by seven steps in preparing the carcass of a deer for the use of food or for uh, for leather. The remaining items listed have to do with riding, building, the kindling and extinguishing of fire, and transportation of articles from one place to another. In addition to these major regulations, there were countless other provisions concerning the observant of the Sabbath, most commonly known is the so-called Sabbath day's journey of 2,000 cubits, which is less than a mile, to about two-thirds of a mile. You could not travel more than one mile or 2,000 cubits from your home on the Sabbath day. It is also, uh, it's also counted as Sabbath breaking to look in a mirror fixed to a wall or even to light a candle. Sadly, these same regulations permitted an egg laid on the Sabbath to be sold to a Gentile, and a Gentile could be hired to light a candle or a fire. Now, I have just teetered a few little examples. Can you imagine? Can you imagine trying to keep these laws of the Sabbath? Exactly. You probably couldn't breathe very deep. The Pharisees were continually employing the letter of man made laws to destroy the spirit of the law of God. The Sabbath was designed by God to give man an opportunity to know his maker and to reflect upon his love and mercy and bountiful blessings. But instead of it reflecting the character of God, it became a reflection of the cruel character of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The Lord teaches us regarding Sabbath rules, whatever draws us closer to him helps us to understand what his, understand his will and leads to the happiness and well-being of others would be the true Sabbath observer. That's the Pharisees. So, Jesus, <laughs> do you forget what day it was when you healed this guy on the Sabbath day? And, and the uproar that this stirs up is going to be just uh, in, in, incredulous. incredulous. Uh, then the Pharisees also ask him again uh, how he had received his sight. So the Pharisees are investigating and and, and they want to know, all right, how did you get your sight? And he said to them, he put, here's, this is the third testimony now, third time. He put clay on my eyes, and, 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 and I wash, and, and I see. Therefore, some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. In other words, the Pharisees said, we know that this couldn't be a God thing because if this guy was God, he would obey the rules. And the rules of the Sabbath are the rules of the Sabbath. I don't know. Religion just loves rules, doesn't it? And I don't know why because most religious people that I know are always looking for some new and creative way to break those rules. But they love rules. And I'll just remind you that God doesn't play by the rules. And you say, well, what are you talking about, Pastor? Well, I'm just telling you that Grace is breaking the rule. I mean, the rule was uh, you sin, you die. The rule was you obey the law. If you don't obey the law, you die. Uh, God said, look, I know you can't obey the law. I know the rules are too hard. I know, I mean, I've known this from the foundation of the world. By the way, let me just mention this to you, that the Old Testament and the New Testament are, is not God waking up one day and saying, oh, I made a mistake. They can't do it. He knew it from the start. Before the foundation of the world, God knew we weren't going to be able to keep the rules. The old, uh, the, Jesus' coming was not something that God just devised when he found out that we were having trouble keeping the rules. That was the, rule, that was the plan all along. But God, I mean, how many of you say favor ain't fair? You know, all right, favor ain't fair. God doesn't play by all of those rules that you guys play by. And so Number five, or number four, you might be a Pharisee if you place rules above relationships. Yeah, if you place rules above relationships, you might be a Pharisee. You might be proven kin to the Pharisees. <laughs> and religious people love those rules. And, and anyway, there you go. Number five, let me fill that one in for you. You might be a Pharisee if you put your interpretation of the Scriptures above the living Word of God, the Lord Jesus. As a matter of fact, you know, when Jesus came, Jesus is the living Word of God, Right? Well, what Jesus did on this earth would be what God would authorize on this earth. What did Jesus say about what he did on this earth, by the way? Do you remember this? Jesus didn't freelance. Jesus wasn't an independent contractor. 
that set foot on the earth and said, I'm God and I'm going to do anything I want to do. No, what did Jesus say about himself? Jesus said, I don't do anything that I don't see my father do. I don't say anything that I didn't hear my father say. So everything that Jesus reflects on this earth, the living word of God, would be the, would be the, 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 the word of God that comes from the throne of God. So if you put the rules above relationships and you put your interpretation of the scriptures above the living word of God, you know one thing I've noticed about religious people is that uh, religious people of Jesus' day and religious people of nowadays, uh, there's not much difference in them. Uh, they always have some type of scripture to go for everything they think is okay. Have you noticed this? I mean, I, I tell you when you can see it best of all when somebody tries to shame you using the scripture, right? Yeah. Well, the Bible says, and then whatever it is they want, they have this cute way of quoting the Bible according to everything they want in life. And then when you respond back, well, I thought you were a Christian, and Christians aren't supposed to act that way. Just a spirit of religion. Bert, number six, you might be a Pharisee if your emphasis is upon proper methodology as opposed to the power of God. In other words, doing things the right way. Uh, there's a proper way to do things. There's a proper methodology is what people have in their mind. And, you know, we have to do things. Uh, the scripture, and I've quoted it before to you. Uh, Tanya, how often, which one was that that we heard so often uh, in our life? When, when, we want, when you want to change anything. Uh, oh, oh yeah. Every, everything must be done decently and in order. Decently and in order. <laughs> yeah, decently according to these rules and, 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 and not according to God's order, but according to your order. You know, religious people have these, have these decently in order. Well, I am so glad that Jesus doesn't follow my decently and in order. How about yours? Or a proper procedure for what needs to be done. I'll just remind you, Jesus healed blind people in lots of ways. As a matter of fact, one of them, I think it's in uh, Mark chapter, in Matthew chapter 9, there were two blind men that followed Jesus down the road. And when Jesus went into a little home, these two blind men followed Jesus into the little house. And he looks and he says, hey, what do you guys want? And they said, we're blind and we want to see and then he said, and Jesus just speaks to them and says, go your way, your faith has made you well. And then there was another blind person uh, that stood by the road uh, screeching at Jesus. His name was, uh, what was his name? Blind Bartho uh, Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, <laughs> stood by the roadside begging. And Jesus walks by and somebody says, it's Jesus. And Bartimaeus started crying out like a screech eagle. Jesus, thou son of Nazareth, say, I need to see Jesus. Starts screeching out like that, and the people say, shh, 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 that's Jesus. You're going to disturb Jesus. And the more they tried to shush him down, the more he screamed and the louder he screamed. And Jesus looked over there, and Jesus said, uh, said uh, hey, come here. And the scripture says that he took his cloak, and he, throw, and he threw his cloak away. I'm just reminding you, blind people don't throw their cloaks away. You know why? Because they can't find it. <laughs> but Bartimaeus, evidently believing that when he comes back from Jesus, he's going to be able to find his, throws his cloak away and comes over there. And Jesus just comes to Bar Bartimaeus and he says, what is it you want? And he said, I want to see Lord. And he said, so he said, may it be done. You know, He just spoke to Bartimaeus. And man, Bartimaeus just... Well, gained his sight. And then in Mark chapter 8 that we looked at last week, you remember the two guy, the guy that followed, and, and he spit in his eye. You remember? He, I mean, he, had, he didn't take it and, and make mud, so he just, he just spit in his eye, and then he took his hand, and he put it over the guy's eye like this, and then he took him off, and he said, uh, all right, what, you see? what do you see? And the guy says, well, I see, I see people, but they look like trees walking around out there. And Jesus said, okay, well, let me pray for you again. And then he put it. He put his hand on him and he prayed for him again and he said, and he made the man look up. And when the man looked up, the man's sight was totally restored to him. And then you got this guy in John chapter 9 who was born blind and Jesus spits on the ground, doodles in the mud, puts the stuff on his eye. I think you get the point. My point is, what method? 
you know, what, 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 kind, what was the method that Jesus used? Jesus used all kinds of methods in life. And so you might be a Pharisee if you put emphasis upon proper methodology as opposed to the power of God. Look, look, Jesus can do whatever Jesus wants to because Jesus is Jesus. And if Jesus wants to spit, man, he can spit as far as I'm concerned. All right, all right, all right. Verse 16, therefore some of the Pharisees said, this man's not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. This can't be some great person. This can't be somebody. He, he's claiming to be God's son, but he can't be from heaven because if he was from heaven, he'd keep the rules of the Sabbath. I'm telling you. Others said, how can a man who is a sinner do such things? And there was a division among them. You know why? Because Pharisees can't get along with other Pharisees. That's what the problem is. You might be a Pharisee if you can't get along with other Pharisees. They can't even get along with themselves, much less anybody else. I mean, I'll just remind you, religion is a, is, is, a, is a vicious, hateful, dangerous spirit. It was religion that stoned Stephen. It was religion that put Paul in prison in Rome in a dungeon. It was religion that crucified Peter upside down. It was religion that nailed Jesus to a rugged cross at Calvary. And, 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 and I just defy you to find a war that has ever been fought in the history of this world that didn't have religious religion all wrapped around it some way or another. You might be a Pharisee if you <laughs> can't get along with other Pharisees. So it's not a surprise when we see that they can't even get along with each other. They said to the blind man again, well, what do you say about him? Because uh, he opened your eyes, and, and I'm, you might be a little encouraged now because you say, well, okay, they're asking the right question. I mean, they are admitting that he opened your eyes, so maybe there's hope for them. Uh, and the guy says, uh, the, which is his, what, fifth testimony now? Uh, he's a prophet. <laughs> what do you say about him? Well, I, I think he's a prophet. Well, I'm thinking it doesn't take a nuclear science, scientists to figure that out, right? <laughs> yeah, he's done something. But the Jews did not believe concerning him that he had been blind and received his sight. So the Jews are not believing that this guy is, is actually... In other words, they, they think that this thing is, is fraudulent. They think that this is a scam that's being perpetrated on everybody. And so they don't believe that this guy has, was actually born blind and that he was actually healed by Jesus. It says, until they called his, the parents of him who had received his sight. So now the whole thing is turned into a full-blown court proceeding. They're going to call some witnesses in. Where are his parents? Because, you know, uh, this stuff is just doesn't, I mean, it's not... It's not making sense, so we got to get his parents in there. So you might be a Pharisee if in the face of reality, you still won't believe. Verse 18, but the Jews did not believe until they had called his parents and, and, and said, is this guy to receive a sight? Now look, look what they asked him. And they asked him saying, is this your son who you say was born blind? I mean, you can almost hear that coming off. Right? Is this, your, this sounds like one of those Senate hearings or House hearings, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Senator from blah, blah. Yes, I would like that. Is this your son that you say was born blind? Is there any real evidence that he was born blind? Are we going to believe just your word that he was born blind? And Verse 20, his parents answered and said to them, we know that this is our son and we know that he was born blind, but by what means he now sees, we, we don't know. Or who opened his eyes, we don't know. He's of age, ask him, he'll speak for himself. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> his parents throw him under the bus. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the Pharisees make, I mean, the parents make a typical mistake that many people make, uh, and that is by allowing, and, and follow me now, and I'm not trying to be critical of all of us, but you know, it's really easy.
to allow religion to take control of everything. It's really easy to, instead of, instead of uh, fighting back, instead of stating the truth, instead of standing for things of God, it's easy to allow them to intimidate you and bluff you and buffalo you and convince you and convict you because they're so dogmatic about what they do. And if we do this, we really become almost as bad as them by not, by not allowing God to, to, to come out of our life. I mean, it's like this. If, if something can block your view of God, you have to be smaller than it is. You know, if, I, if, if I'm not smaller, I, it won't block my view. So what I'm saying is that we have a responsibility to... Um, to stand for the things of God when we see the things of God and not allow religion to buffalo us. And believe me, uh, it happens everywhere. And, and if you're not careful, it's so easy for that to happen. Because let me just give you a, a little warning about something. And, and here it is. When God moves into a place, things are going to destabilize. Because God is so big that when God moves into a place, he just can't help but run over some of our, our religious furniture. You know, really, it's just, God is so big. It's just like pregnancy. What does pregnancy guarantee? Pregnancy guarantees there's going to be some stretching around here, right? Well, God is so big that when God comes in, I can guarantee you that there's going to be some stretching going on in the house. And there are going to be lots of things that maybe this has never happened before. Or I don't, is this, I mean, is this God? Can we believe this? Can we trust this? And so, uh, and so the parents cater to the Pharisees. And um, I mean, it's really kind of hard to blame them because the Pharisees have already decided something you'll see in just a minute that scared them to death. But let's go on. All right. Uh, he'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had agreed already that if anyone confessed that he was Christ, that he would be put out of the synagogue. How's that for a foregone conclusion? How's that for a don't confuse me with the facts, my mind is already made up kind of deal in life? They had already decided, all right, if anybody says that Jesus did this thing, then we're going to just kick them right out of the, right out of the synagogue. And so, therefore, his parents said, he's of age, ask him. Verse 24, so they again called the man who was blind. So where was he? Well, he was probably out looking at the clouds, <laughs> uh, watching the birds fly, uh, looking at a flower. You know, I mean, he had been... He, he, he's never seen in his entire life, and he's, he's out taking advantage of the fact that he can see. Well, and, and, and it's fair to say, well, go call him. Go call him. And I can just see somebody come out. Uh, hey, Bo, hey, Bo. They want you back, back up there at the church house. Oh, man. Boy, they'll kill you at the church house. I'm telling you that. And it is often the dullest place of the week, you know. And, and, and so I can see him, you know, he's got to be dragged back to the house, and, 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 they, and they said to him when he got there, now look at this paradox here. They said to him when he got there, give glory to God. This man's a sinner. <laughs> I mean, it, give glory to God. It's about time God got some glory in the thing, right? And some praise in the thing. And you think, okay, well, this is a good thing. Give glory to God. That's what I've been doing is giving glory to God. This guy's from God. This guy healed me. I've been giving glory and praise and word to, to God and, uh, and they say, well, give glory to God, which looks like a good positive thing. And then they crash and burn on the next sentence. Uh, uh, we know that this man's a sinner. In other words, don't be giving Jesus credit for this. If you did get healed of being blind, God did it. This man is a sinner. He can't do anything like that. And then this young man makes a mistake that um, people who really are not aware of the true nature of the Pharisees and, 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 and don't realize that they do not have, uh, uh, what would we call it, an overwhelming sense of humor, let's just say. Uh, this is a mistake he makes. He answered and he said, well, whether he's a sinner or not, uh, I don't know. But one thing I know is that though I was blind, now I see. <laughs> so you might be a Pharisee if you hate emotions. I don't know about, you know, a lot of people are very much against emotions. 
Uh, a lot of people say, well, we can't live on emotion. We can't, you know, we can't be controlled by experiences of emotion. Now, let me just say this. I'm, uh, I've said it this way, and you've heard other people say it this way. You've heard other people, uh, people say, um, a man with an experience is not at the mercy of a man with an argument. Have you heard that before? A man with an experience is not at the mercy of a man with an argument. Now, a lot of times, that's churchy people's way of saying that if I've had an experience, it's legitimate no matter what. I mean, that, we hear that in a lot, a lot of charismatic stuff, you know. Well, you know, I don't care what you say about the theology of tongues or healings or whatever it might be. I just know what happened to me as if what happened to me is the is the end all to everything in life. So you, but you, you can't base your life on, some, on an experience. But when an experience matches what the Word of God says about things, experiences are wonderful in life. We've been saved. We've, we're redeemed. Our sin has been gone. You know, we've had experiences with God. As long as they line up with the Scripture and the Spirit and the Word of God, uh, fine. I don't mind experience. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm not really, I, I really am not sure that you could ever have a real experience with God without having some emotion involved in it. Are you? I'm, I mean, I, do you think God is emotional? <laughs> do, you think, do you think the angels are emotional? Yeah. So anyway, he's, uh, he, you might, if you hate emotions, you might be a Pharisee. Uh, then they said to him again, well, what did he do to you? And I'm, and I'm going, why do you want to know that? You've already said you don't believe it. Are you going to be any better if he explains it to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already, and you don't listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Here's where, he's, here's where he doesn't understand that they're not really going to, they're not very, they're not very humorous people. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to be his disciple? <laughs> the, guy, the guy says, oh, I get it. I know why you want to hear it again, because you want to be his disciple. And, uh, and, 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 now, and now, they, uh, now things get dangerous. Um, verse 28, then they reviled him. Revile, reviled him means to belittle him and to put him down and to you know, crush him. Then they reviled him and said, you are his disciples, but we are Moses' disciples. Which is, I mean, you can almost hear that kind of stained glass sound in their voice, right? We, we are Moses' disciples. <laughs> I mean, you can hear, you can hear that steeple-throated sound. Uh, God, uh, yeah. <laughs> you are his disciples, but we're Moses' disciples, which brings us to another. You might be a Pharisee if you have to, must resurrect past loyalties to cover up a present lousy attitude. In other words, if you've got to brag about, you got to brag about what you used to be to cover up what, how lousy you are now, that's, you might be a Pharisee. Number 20, verse 29, we know that God spoke to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he's from, which he's fixing to pop him again. You're talking about leading, you're talking about leading with your chin, that right there, they lead with their chin, and this non-religious fellow just takes full advantage of it. Watch him in the next verse. The man answered and said to them, why, this is a marvelous thing that you don't know where he's from, and yet he's opened my eyes. In other words, hey, guys, I thought you were supposed to be the, the, the watchers of the spirit world here. I thought you were supposed to know everything about what the spirit was doing. How'd this guy, this guy got under your spiritual radar. He flew in here under your radar, right? You don't know who he is, and he opened my eyes. How could that be, guys? Uh-huh, yeah, he's getting, a little, little, he's getting a little bolder now, yeah. Now, we know, now, uh, and listen, the guy keeps on saying, now, we know that God does not hear sinners. Now, the only thing God hears from sinners is uh, uh, save me, forgive me, uh, some, some type of repentance toward God. But the Bible says, you know, God, when you pray and you, you don't know the Lord, you don't have any relationship with the Lord, he doesn't hear what you say. For we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. And this guy's just saying, look, he healed me of my blindness, and you're saying he's a sinner, and I'm just saying that if God doesn't hear sinners, but he heard this guy say, open up the eyes of the blind, how could he be a sinner? Verse 32, since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. 
And lots of people have been blind for cataracts, blind from lots of other reasons, but this guy was born blind. As a matter of fact, you know that some of the, some of the, the theologians and historians uh, think that this guy, most likely because he was born blind, that he had a congenital blindness and that it was caused because he didn't have any eyes. He didn't have any physical eyes in his sockets. And, uh, and, and so a statement like that would certainly be apropos to that. You know, nobody's ever healed anybody that doesn't even have any eyes. I mean, come on, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a miracle. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, you were completely born in sin. <laughs> now they, now they want to now they wanna, uh, insult him. Now, yeah, you were completely born in sins, and you're teaching us, and they cast him out. Which brings us to the last, you might be a Pharisee. You might be a Pharisee if when you run out of, run out of arguments, you want to eliminate people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You were completely born in sins. Well, yeah, he was completely born in sins, just like everybody else. Seemed like a good time to lead him to the Lord right there if you, you, know, if you really were, were real, right? But instead of trying to lead him to the Lord or helping him encourage him to believe God, they just kicked him out of the synagogue. So here's this guy kicked out of the synagogue. I'm going to read you a few verses, uh, finish it up. Uh, here's this guy who's been kicked out of the synagogue. All right, now, you know, he's, he's been blind for all of his life, but I'm sure nothing like this has ever happened to him before. So he's walking down the road. He just got kicked out of the synagogue, got kicked out of church. I don't want him down there anymore. <laughs> and, you know, it had to sting a little bit. You know, it had to kind of, kind of, kind of hurt a little bit. And, uh, and, and, and he's walking down the road, and he's thinking... Uh, Thinking to himself, probably something like this. Um, what just happened? What in the world got me kicked out of church? Let's see, okay, I was blind, and then, and then Jesus put some mud on me and told me to go down by the pool, and I did, and I came back seeing. Oh, whoa, I know what it was. I came back seeing. That, that was what my problem was. I was blind, and now I can see. Well, I, if, I don't know about you, but I would rather see than monkey around down here at the synagogue anytime. So, so he's going away, and everything, he, he's walking away. And, oh, wait a minute, let me go back, because I want you to see this. Jesus heard that, he, that they had cast him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the Son of God? All right, remember... This guy doesn't know Jesus. He's never seen Jesus. Jesus was gone when he came back. But when Jesus heard that they kicked the guy out of church, Jesus, you know, Jesus has compassion on people that get kicked out of stuff. Especially churches. Especially churches. And so Jesus evidently starts looking for him because it said, and when he had found him, which implies what? That he had been looking for him. So when he found him, so Jesus starts looking for the guy and when he found him, he comes to him and he says, do you believe in the Son of God? He answered and said, who is he, Lord, that I might believe? Just, just innocent as he could be. Mm -hmm. Just that, just that, that non-religious uh, openness about himself. You know, who, well, who is he, Lord, so I, so I can believe? And Jesus said to him, you have both seen him, and it is he who's talking with you. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. Now, this took quite a bit, a bit of courage to worship him because to us, that's just a line, you know, and he worshiped him. But now think about what that meant. Think about what worship is. Worship is pronouncing worth-ship. In other words, why you are worthy to be praised are to be loved. And so he starts speaking and manifesting worship to Jesus right there on the streets. You just kind of lose your, your spiritual caution when you're in the presence of Jesus, I think. And Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world that those who do not see may see, just like you, not only physically but spiritually. Why, I've come into the world so that somebody who doesn't see will see. And that those who see, who see may be made blind. In other words, I've come to the world for two reasons. To open the eyes of them who want me so they can see. The ones who know they can't see. The ones who are blind. 
that they might see. But those who think they can see, they're going to be made blind by me. Now, what this is, don't let that, I mean, I know that's kind of a little uh, unusual little statement there. But in, in the birth of Jesus, there was a prophet there named Simeon. Do any of you know that name? When Jesus was born and they brought Jesus to the temple and, and, and before they, they you know, of course, he was a little baby and they, they circumcised him and all that. And Simeon sees him. Simeon the prophet sees him. And Simeon starts praying that the Lord would allow him to see the Christ and so forth. And, and so Simeon starts proclaiming things. And, and, and Simeon says, let's see, did I put that up on a slide? I don't think that's, No. Simeon says to him, when he sees little baby Jesus, he puts his hand on him and he says, this child is set for the rise and the fall of many in Israel. In other words, you are either going to rise or you're going to fall on Jesus. In other words, if you believe, then he's going to take you to heaven. If you reject, then you're going to hell. In other words, you, he, he, you are either going to believe him, you're going to go up, or you're going to go down based on what you do with this child right here. And this is what Jesus is basically saying, that you guys that think you can see, uh, you're gonna, I'm going to make you blinder because you're going to reject me even more. And, he, and now he, you would think all the Pharisees would be gone by now, but no, they don't. They hang around because they love to be offended, and they'll look you up to get offended. But some of them still hanging around, then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard these words and said, Are we blind also? See, they're offended. They heard Jesus just say that. And they said, Are you talking about us? And he said, Then Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. In other words, <laughs> if you were blind, you wouldn't be held accountable for this. But because you say we see, uh, your sin remains. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what these people need? These people need a radical pharisaicomy, don't they? A radical, a radical pharisaicomy. Yeah. What is that, you might say? Uh, it, yeah, yeah. What is that? What is that? Well, the best way to understand, P-H-A-R-I-C, I-A-C-E-C-T-O-M-I. -E Something like that. <laughs> radical Pharisee. You say, what is that? Well, the, the best explanation of radical Pharisaeectomy happens in the Old Testament. And I think I put the passage up here. I did. I think First Chronicles. Yeah, I did. It's called the Obed-Edom principle. You remember Obi? Yeah, we know Obed-Edom. Obed-Edom was that little guy that stood by the... He was... He was they were bringing the cart back. The Philistines had stolen the Ark of the Covenant, which is that box that had the gold and the angels, and, and it housed the Spirit of God. How many of you have seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? It's, I know it's an old movie, but, you know, that's, that's the Ark of the Covenant. And, and the top, you lift the top off, and psh, God comes out. Well, I mean, not just a symbol of God, but, I mean, this was actually where God lived, actually, in the Old Testament, in this Ark of the Covenant are part of the power of God. I don't know how it, it couldn't contain all of God. But anyway, that's beyond point. But anyway, they, they're, bringing him, they're bringing him back. They're bringing, the Philistines stole him and took him down to Dagon's temple, which Dagon's that big old dog-looking god that the Philistines had. You know, it's got the head of a dog, like a German shepherd, kind of big tall. That's Dagon, and that was the god of the Philistines. And they put, he had a temple, and they put the ark in the temple. And when they came back the next morning, morning Dagon was laying on his face. And so then they stood him back up. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to, I, I don't think I want a God that you have to maintain, right? All right, yeah, yeah. They stand him back up. They have to stand him back up. And then, and then the next night they came out and he was back down on his face again. The ark was in, he put the ark, he put him in the room with the ark, boom, ark put him on the ground. And, um, and so the Philistines get scared because they'd already killed 19,000 of them. I mean, when he, they tried to open it up, and when they did, 19,000 of them died right there on the spot. So they got scared, so they, they got a little cart, and they hooked some milk cows to it. And, and they put the ark on the cart, and they, and they 
they kind of whipped on the milk cows and got them headed down the road going toward Israel. And when he crossed the county line down there for Israel, the Israelites saw it and they went running down there to get it. And David the king came from Jerusalem with all the mighty men and so forth. And, but they just they took, took it off of that little milk cart deal they had it on and they put it on a brand new wooden cart and they hooked oxen to it. Now, this wasn't how you, got, you have to carry the ark. There, there was a procedure for this. This wasn't it, but that, they did it. And so they they carrying it down the road back toward Jerusalem, and they get up to the place called the threshing floor. And when they get there, there's a there's a hole evidently in the road, and the cart kind of goes down in the hole like this. And a guy named Uzzah reaches up to keep the to keep the ark from falling off the cart and gets struck dead right there on the spot. And when that happens, boy, everything breaks loose. Everybody, everybody ran. Everybody starts running around, hollering, "Whoa!" And, and, and everybody's scared. They're in shock. They're all running around. Look at us is laying dead right there. And uh, the ark's still on the cart back up here. And, and everybody's going. And then, and, then, and then somebody says, what are we going to do with the ark? And us says, I mean, uh, and, and Obed said, I'll take it. I'll take it. And, and look, so David would not move the ark with him into the city of David, but took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, and the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that he had. You know, all that he had. His, his, his kids made good grades at school. Um, his daughters were more beautiful than they'd ever been. His sons were more handsome than they'd ever been. The cattle, Obed's, Obed's cattle were fat and healthy. And the wool, they cut off more wool than anybody else. And his crops just went wild. And then everybody looked at him and everybody said, Obi, what's the deal? And he said, it's that piece of furniture that's in my house right in there. He said, God, God's in there. God's with me. God's with me in there. And they said, well, would you just tell us one thing? How in the world did you get that thing? And he said, well, you know, Everything was going wild, and everybody's in shock, and somebody said, what are we going to do with the ark? And I just said, I I'll take it, and that's how I got it. Yeah.